All right, and welcome back to another episode of the Indie Investor Pod. Uh, my name is Brian Snyder. We are Indie Investors talking Indie Investing. I got Sterling Davis and Dave Short with me again here today. And this ended up just turning into a big, long episode about us talking about, hey, we make a lot of mistakes. We mess up a lot of things. So I think we could probably talk for maybe 10 episodes on this stuff. But this is going to be a continuation of what we talked about in our last episode that we did together. Of We were talking about things that we made mistakes with or things that we would change. And we turned it into a lot of a hey, professional stuff and team building and things like that. Today, we're going to focus a little bit more on what we could do within our specialties and within real estate investing specific project specific. So that's what we're going to do with today's show. And with that, let's get on with it. All right. And welcome back to another episode of the Indie Investor Pod. So fellas, I thank you so much for all the, just the insights, the value that you brought to the last episode on, we're talking about professionalism and team building and, you know, having the right people in place, getting the right people in the right seats, that they're all rowing in the same direction. I think it's so very important that they have the right personalities, that they fit your culture, your team. So much value with that kind of stuff. Um, and I know right when we got started, I was like, okay, we can talk a lot about this stuff, and which is usually the case with us three. Um, and then we can really kind of, with this episode, I'd like to kind of get into a little bit more of, hey, within our specialty specific or within real estate specific on projects and things, what are some of those mistakes that, we, that we've made along the way that we've learned from and we can bring some value to other people because they're going to come across, uh, come across these same things or have to make certain decisions that we've already made the mistakes on. So I hope they can learn from us. Dave, I'm going to lead off with you because you were on the last episode, you were kind of talking a little bit more about like making sure that you had enough time to check on projects that you had going on. You were worried about always finding the next deal or finding the next property, which is a big part of your business but then you maybe lose time because you didn't have time to check on certain projects or lose this and lose that. So when you're talking about that on, on maybe kind of making a mistake or learning from that, of how do, you, how do you do that then to find enough time to check on all your projects to make sure you have the right, the right things going on and you have the things, you, you basically know what's going on with your projects. Yeah, we're, um, we're fairly hands-on in our projects. And like today, you know, we're, we're working on probably nine different projects and uh, all of them fairly, you know, for the most part, fairly extensive. So, but with us, we, um, you know, you, you don't want to get too far ahead of yourself on these projects and make sure you can, you can do them. Like right now, we, we, you know, we had actually wholesaled a couple properties because I didn't think we could get to them for, you know, 30, 45 days and do them do them justice, but yet you still didn't want to pass on the project. Yeah. My wife says I have a meth habit on houses. That <laughs> if it's there, it's hard for me not to not to try to get the house done. Yeah. Well, I think but, that's something that we've probably all learned on, learned you know from experience on too. Of just like you you kind of made that decision of like, hey, I don't know if I can get to this project, so I'm going to wholesale it. Like when when there there's no better time to wholesale a property right now or get rid of a project that you don't know you're going to get to because the market is so hot. So kind of making that decision, I feel like maybe, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, Dave, would you have like kind of stretched those out and been like, oh, I, I'm going to hold on to these because I want to, I want to make sure no, I have no a project question. in place. No and, question. Yeah. And, you know, there's projects that, you know, today we would wholesale, but I don't, in my mind, we can't wholesale them because of the circumstances that we bought them under, mm -hmm. you know, where somebody brought us a really nice deal and we're happy with it. We, we're not concerned about what the wholesaler made, but yet if we re-wholesale it, and then this, you know, and that seller looks at us and thinking, okay, what'd you guys do to me? You yeah. know, so we're just better off just redoing the project mm -hmm. and taking a little more profit than, you know, hey, maybe my first choice would have been to, to wholesale this property. But one of the things that that it ties into all of this is I'm really, really poor about getting all the details in writing with with contractors. Uh, understanding I've got a contractor now he's not as organized as some of the others he does really he does good work at fair pricing and he's given me a bid and I have no idea you know and I'm I've, I've battled him for four days now I said all I I'm happy with your price tell me what it includes yeah and that way I can't get an accurate scope from you until I know if the gutters are included in this bid, <laughs> right. is the cost of flooring included in the bid? He said, well, flooring's included. And I said, well, you know, I use flooring that costs $2.79 a foot for it. Well, I, I found some stuff at Lowe's at $1.49. I said, well, that's not acceptable for my flip. Yeah. 
So I just need to know if I have cost overruns based on what I do. I said, so most flippers take the investor, you know, take that contractor and say, well, it's 17.5 to do the deal. It includes the flooring, the paint. Uh, it includes the kitchen cabinets. And all of a sudden, he's including all of this stuff that gets real close to the cost of his job. Mm -hmm. So he's not leaving a lot over. So I now I know I have a problem with that contractor on that he can't deliver what he's he's given me. Under, under, but yet a lot of investors, hey, I got a great price from this guy. And then you talk to the flipper, you know, six months later, and, oh, my contractor's quit. He hasn't done the job. He hasn't finished. I can't find him. And I said, tell me you haven't paid him all the money. Well, I've paid him. Yeah. I said, so, so you have. Yeah. You know, so he's gone because you underbid. And I said, well, what are you going to, what's he going to do it for? And I said, the guy can't do it for that. It was an unreasonable expectation on your part and, you know, on, and on his part. And he just well, ran out of money. Well, I think that's where like Brian was talking about, like as quickly as possible, last episode, use professionals, right? Um, in the sense, because that's what, it's happened to all of us before, right? When you, you're in a job and when we first started, we used people that would give us a price. They probably didn't even have an invoice paper and <laughs> they would do it. And one or two things would happen when they discover uh, an item is different from because we want this flooring or, oh, they didn't take that into consideration. They either eat it, which puts pressure on them now to do a job that isn't making them as much money or losing them money, or they come back for a change order because of X, Y, and Z. And now we're over budget because we didn't budget for that, right? So it's always interesting to be able to see when you don't put those things out there and you don't line item it, because you don't need the opposite. The first, the first thing I said, when it comes to, it puts pressure on them and they just eat it. That's just as bad as, if it comes to us on a change order because you don't want your contractor sitting here losing money because then that puts unnecessary pressure and they cut in corners and that's when things go bad as well. So I think you have to be very careful when people are doing this because I mean, let's be real. One of the biggest changes that happened to us in our property management business is when we first start started, I was using people in my houses that were they insured. Yeah. Somehow they was indirectly insured through their cousin um, who all work under the same GC number. And, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and then what I start realizing, because I wanted to give people the same great deal that I was getting. I'm like, man, this house works because I can get this rehab for $10,000. And, but it doesn't work if I have to pay 30000 which is probably the correct price that I should have been paying for. So I had to start using more professional people because of uh, the, the, the cost of getting sued for me, like for Dave, like it's his, it's his house. So he's working and flipping for me. I'm working on somebody else's house uh, in a sense, and I can't afford them to do a bad job because I'm going to be responsible. It's one of the biggest gripes that we have is Sterling, you guys, uh, vendors are expensive. I'm like, well, listen, there's guy that, is kind of insured, kind of not insured, never going to see him on TV. It's the guy a step above there that's like, he has insurance, he doesn't do advertisements, he's just really good at what he does, and he's not a premium vendor, but he does good work. And then it's the step above, you see him on Google, Angie's List, and things like that. We yeah. strive to get people in that middle. But unfortunately, those people are more competitive now than they've ever been. So they are now a little bit more expensive, but I can't jump down to the next level because I will get in trouble if, if I allow him to go in your house and mess up something. So I think it's interesting to be able to see that dynamic um, for just that the, using professionals um, to be able to do your job now. Versus well, and you have to vet, you know, and vetting, vetting your contractors, you know, my biggest key to vetting is when I'm hiring somebody new, besides the references, I want to meet him at a house and walk through a current project that he's doing. 
So, and I want to see what's his estimate for this. Where are you at on budget on that house? Yeah. And I'll always go like an hour early so I can bullshit with his help. Hey, Brian, great to work with. What's, you know, what's the deal here? Is, yeah. you know, is, is the, you know, how, I said, when's the last time you saw Brian on the job? So, well, he was here last week, I think, you know, so it's probably not the guy I want to hire because he's, he, if the general is not, you know, seeing your project at least twice a week, he doesn't know if he's on budget to, to meet the budget he's given me. So I want to go back to one thing too, um, kind of Dave said, just the whole of like making sure you have stuff in writing and stuff. There's the whole, the invoice thing and making sure the person has insurance and, and being professional and stuff like that. But there's also something too of, especially when you're starting to work with somebody of having things in writing, because when I say I want something or I want something done on something, my vision is going to be different than what Sterling's is and what I can say like, Hey, I want the kitchen to look like this, but we all know that like, unless it's in writing and it's written down specifically, like what that really means to me my contractor might look at that completely different. I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah. If I heard that, yeah, I'll just do this like rental grade, like blah, blah, blah. This is what it is. But when it comes to finished projects, the product is going to look completely different than what I had in my head and stuff. So making sure those things are written down, especially when you're starting to work with people too, to make sure you're on the same page, I think is huge. So. Yeah. I, I'm going to pivot a little bit uh, as we're talking about just different things uh, inside of our, our businesses and things like that, man. I, I think, you know, one of the things that stand out uh, as we started growing uh, our property management, as well as just buying and holding my own real estate um, was the things that got me, the things that got me to the one level was the same things that killed me at the next. Uh, meaning like, uh, you know, we were very people and personalities at the one level. And that's what people loved about us. They love the idea that they can call Alexa and she's available and have that people and personalities. Um, at the next level, it was about processes and procedures, right? Like, so the, the people's and personalities is the thing that people was kind of upset about because it's like, listen, like I'm talking to her all the time and I'm talking to Sterling all the time, but what is the process to get us from one level to the next, right? So I think it's imperative to not lean on um, like, you know, if there's seven levels into, uh, you know, an organizational chart inside of it, whatever has that you're great at now can't be the thing that's going to take you to that next level. And, you know, for us, you know, it's some of those basic tools, um, you know, that I think you have to identify. We talked about last episode when it comes to bookkeeping, you know, when do you add a professional bookkeeper versus when do you not? Because let's be real. I mean, profitability is the, we want to get to profitability as quickly as possible. Most companies, profitability is the number one thing that we want to get to almost immediately. So uh, for us, we, we, the things that we were doing when it came to virtual bookkeepers and, um, you know, virtual VAs that were handling certain segments of our business, we couldn't keep those things going uh, for us to be successful. We kind of had to pivot and get a bigger bookkeeping company that was going to be able to take our, 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 our hard copies of everything and really hold accountable our vendors to be on a pay schedule and, and things that are going to help us grow. But those things worked <laughs> for uh, us when we initially got here. You know, I mean, we were the cool people that had VAs and we were working quickly. Uh, but those are the same things that killed us when it comes to future growth and opportunities and losing clients because of not being able to have true capacity of, uh, of it and as well as being able to get answers quickly enough to those people. Yeah, and I think it's Sterling, do you, okay. oh, I was going to say, Sterling, do you, um, do you feel your vendors, um, the people that work for you, do they have to be, do they have to be successful? Do they have to be like-minded? like yourself um it depends on what you say because like i mean i i work with a lot of people that aren't you know moderates uh on a political level and maybe not christians right <laughs> you know um but i i think it has to be a certain integrity in everybody's job right like everybody knows the role um you know i i love the 
idea um, when it comes to um, a certain belief. Um, and I think you have to be a hard worker. You know, I, I hired a young lady last week and um, yeah, my, uh, my team was kind of split on her, to be honest. She's going to look at this and be like, oh my God, uh, that's what they thought of me. But I think it's, it, it helps people. Uh, it, hopefully it helps or blesses somebody by this, right? So um, we were kind of split. Like I, I wanted her. The number one reason why I wanted her um, was because number one, she had a desire to be there. Like she wanted to be part of our company. Like her desire to be part of our company and her research that she did to be part of our company was something that was unmatched. Uh, the second part, she, she, she was a willing participant to learn. Like for me, with those two traits, I can have that person run through a wall <laughs> because she has a desire and she's willing to learn. I, it's not, you might not even be good for this position, but this person I can utilize in some way. So, you know, the people on my staff was like, well, I mean, they had some other issues. They were like, well, can she do this? Can she do this? I said, listen, with the right training, and maybe that's the vision in, in me, right? Like I can see some wrongs and I'd be like, listen, with some right trainings, this can be Michael Jordan, right? Like we can polish uh, things up. And I, I think it's so interesting to be able to build your team. Well, because once I, I mean, when I've had contractors, and maybe they're doing a good job, maybe they're not. But I saw the way they were treating their employees. You know, yeah. thinking this, I, I'm not happy here. I, I, I don't want to do this. You know, when I had somebody, you know, managing, you know, it's like, okay, just not, you know, you're, you know, if you can't treat, if, you're, if your contractor can't treat his employees properly, he's not going to keep them. You know, he might have the best team in the world today, but if he's, basically dogging them all the time they're not going to be there because they're in demand by you know from somebody else and those people aren't loyal though dave like those, those people that, not loyal. if you don't if you don't treat that person right then why are you going to treat me right in a different situation right, right? so i always look at those cues like I, I i feel like if you're mean to somebody else you're going to be mean to me like you know so i think it's important to make sure the people that you're working with and you're building these teams that you kind of identify those qualities i'm one of those people with my team and stuff like that i often just sit and listen to them interact and stuff like that and they don't realize what i'm doing because as the vision person i need to understand as we talked last uh, time i'm looking for a facilitator and I have to make decisions based off of, do I have that person in this, uh, in this office right now? Uh, I just listen how they interact with each other. I'm like, is that a facilitator? Or is that a future visionary that might feel like they're bogged down in that facilitated role if I don't, if I don't move them, right? So yeah, I think I mean, it's very important to- I, I need a facilitator today. And, you know, and yet, you know, how do you, you know, a facilitator's not an employee. You know, it has to be somebody beside you that you interact and work with. Yeah. Do you feel like everybody, you feel like, uh, it's a job? Do you feel, do you feel like, um, I probably shouldn't ask you this. Never mind. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I will say, I want to, I want to jump in here a little bit on, on what you guys are talking about. You know, when you're talking about those people in the, in the, you know, in the right spots and in the right seats and things like that and looking for a facilitator, kind of, it all comes back to something you said a little bit earlier, Sterling, you need to have the procedures and the process and the systems in place. So for example, you brought this girl on and said, hey, with the right training, I think she's going to be okay and she's going to be a rock star. But do you have that training in place? Or when you guys are looking at the facilitators and stuff like that, if you don't have, you know, if you don't have the process and procedures in place, you need somebody that will put the process and procedures in place for you to carry out your vision and be able to do that stuff. So it's kind of when we're coming into, you know, just the business in general and things that, that you need to change, we're, you know, the big overwhelming things that you guys are hearing are, having the right people, the right team around you with the right vision, the right things that, that you believe in that they're carrying out as well, the right process, procedures and systems and everything like that in place as well. I'm going to add one more thing to that. And that's kind of my thing of like what I would change a little differently or do differently that we're doing now that would have made a bigger difference, you know, two years ago. And that's also knowing my numbers, um, knowing my numbers of what we're doing, you know, what numbers can I buy deals for in this area or, you know, and I would say this even comes back to the people too, of not just that I know the numbers, but the people that are doing the jobs, they know their numbers as well. So for example, in our role, when our role is based off of, we need leads coming in, we need as many properties as we can. 
Um, same thing. If you're flipping, you want to be able to, Dave's always looking for the next project. If you're a property management, your, your people are always looking for the next house. You need properties. I know that I need to, you know, send out this many offers each day to be able to be able to look at this many houses, to get this many walkthroughs, to be able to do this and things. So knowing your numbers is very, very important, but also that your team knows the numbers as well. So when I'm looking at those team members and I say, Hey James, how many walkthroughs did you do today or this week or how many offers did you put in? He's like, Oh, I don't know. I think about, no, there's no, I don't think about, you need to know how many <laughs> offers you did, you know, what it is and things like that, because it's all a math problem to be able to get, to be able to sell, you know, 25 properties a month. I need to be able to get this many leads in. I need to be able to do this many walkthroughs. I need to be able to send this many offers. It's all a math problem. And I'll have to figure out. So knowing the numbers and that your team knows the numbers, I think is one of the biggest things that a lot of people miss um, really in all of our industries across the board, because we need to know what those numbers are to be able to be successful and be able to back up kind of what we're preaching and things. I know with us too, when it comes to marketing, I've gotten this mistake of where I'll just like throw some money at, you know, to do some marketing, just to try something different to try to generate more leads. But where was, where was my analytics behind what, what was, that was my decision to do this. Okay. To be able to justify spending this amount of money will it generate this amount of leads. Okay. After three months, it doesn't cut it off. We don't want to do it anymore. So knowing that, I think knowing the numbers is that kind of that third step to everything we're talking about. And so very important to all of our jobs. Yeah. I think, I think also you have to, if I can add to that, I think you have to be able to trust the numbers and, and make sure you don't manipulate the numbers. I, I'm, I'm faced with, and this <laughs> yeah. is what I'm talking about uh, on the buy and hold side is because at the end of the day, sometimes as a buy and hold investor, it's, it's similar to what I talked about the first episode uh, when it came to, I didn't know that I was a business person until I got a huge office and I didn't know if I was a business person until I got the right car, which is all false, right? So sometimes as a buy and hold investor and as a flip investor or a wholesaler, we don't know that we're uh, any of those things unless we're having activity. And that activity, we can confuse activity with achievement. Uh, so just because we're active and we're doing things does not mean that we're achieving anything. Just because we're buying houses, if those numbers don't work and we don't trust our, our numbers that we align, does not mean that we're achieving our goals. So I think it's important to not only know your numbers, but to be able to analyze your numbers so that it's the most effective uh, to your business. You know what I mean? For us, we started at every month, I feel like we add new metrics that we start looking at. You know, last month was, uh, we like six months ago, I dove in and I realized that we had a call center that was taking all of our call center uh, calls for leasing. And I was, I just assume that if a call center is taking all my call center calls, that they're answering 100% of those calls. <laughs> because the result I was getting was success. Like we were written out properties in nine days. We were doing everything. I started diving into the numbers and they were missing 20% of the calls that they were receiving. And to me, I said, wait a minute, Th that might not seem like a big deal, but it is a big deal if we could have rented that in nine days from three days, right? So I think it's important just because it's working to, then the numbers of sales and leasing and things is working, it might be too late. And this is what happened to us, COVID hit, right? So then we started really diving into numbers. We were like, whoa, what are the numbers we need to know? But it could be too late to start mm -hmm. lo looking at those finite numbers. We knew that we were leasing out properties when it was hot and the numbers of leasing out properties, we were leasing out 30 to 40 a month. But the true number that we was missing was 20% of the calls that we were getting were being missed. Yeah. That cannot happen. So I think as much as anything, keep just because you have a set number today, dive in deeper and deeper and deeper and find more numbers that can support it. Yeah. To be able to trust your numbers, you have to be able to check on them and know, you know, be on top of your numbers and understand them and know that the metrics you're tracking are actually the ones that you need and stuff too. Um, to go right, back to trusting your numbers. We've all been in that situation where it's like, Hey, yeah, we've all, we've all made the numbers work to try to get a deal done. And that usually has <laughs> yeah. turned out bad for us in some way. Uh, yeah. I think we can all relate to that. So sorry, Dave, what were you saying? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, that, you know, what you guys have been talking about hits my business on the nail. Mm -hmm. And we've done our numbers the last 18 months and better than we've ever done them. And the conclusion that I've come to, I can reduce my business 30% and be more profitable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it, it's, it becomes eye-opening. 
on it saying, okay, I can work 30% less and make more money. And but that's knowing the numbers yeah. on it. So it's not about, you know, you guys are looking to scale just, you know, cause you're aging and I'm looking to, you know, get in a position. I don't want to scale. I want to get back, but because I don't have that facilitator and is it too late to bring that guy, you know, to, you know, when that guy appears, I'll know, you know, I, I, I just think, and, you know, rather than look for the guy, I think in, in my mind, he needs to appear. So, and you can, you can send all applications for Dave's facilitator too. <laughs> so I'll tell you what, though, Dave, Dave, we were, <laughs> I'll say after, uh, after our last, um, after our last Cyria meeting, um, the three of us with, you know, along with Will Hall and Ben Grice, we all went out for, you know, a drink afterwards and some food and we were, and I got into a conversation with Will and Ben just about our hiring, about the hiring process and the onboarding process and how do you find talent and things like that. And it brought up to me of like, you know, I, and I told them I was honest with them and maybe it's not a, a great way to go about business. And a lot of coaches might, you know, not like that, not like this, but my, the way I come from it is if I find talent for me to find talent, I don't necessarily go out and, 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 you know, put out applications or put out things on, wise hire and stuff like that. I go out there and find the talent that I want. Um, so if I want, if I'm looking for a salesman, I'm going to go to, you know, a car dealership and find those, find out somebody like that, or, you know, go to different meetups and find that guy that's hungry, that, that knows the business already, that's looking for that next level, that next step. So I'm kind of in that position and kind of what you said, like, they're going to appear, they're going to come out. That's what, that's the way I look for talent and say, Hey, I, I, I think this person is great. I just, you know, find somebody on Facebook, I'm like, man, I really like the way that this guy carries on a conversation on Facebook. It seems like they are talking about it. I'll go out, you know, buy them lunch and just pick their brain and see if it's somebody that I even maybe six months from now, I'm going to need somebody. I can reach back out to them and say, Hey, this is the person that I want on my team. Um, so that's kind of how I handle that and stuff. But, and, um, and I think, you know, I think just learning from you two, and I thought that was a great discussion that you guys were having um, because, you know, it broke down even from the personality trait of, you know, why you as a teacher work so well as a facilitator. Right. Like, you know, what I mean, so th that was a pretty cool discussion. But also, I thought what I found what I take from this as well as learning from Dave over the years is is the idea that you have to pay somebody a very like it's a very narrow like Dave call it you staying on a rail like the rail is you pay somebody just a salary and they do their job. But I love the ability of like a Dave short or yourself and the being able to say, all right. I know this is the need I have. How do I get this completed? And how can I fund this way of getting them done? Um, so I think a lot of times with myself beforehand, I would say, well, I can't afford to hire somebody right now. I'm only making this much money. That would take the profit that I'm making. And I think it's, it's, it's amazing to be able to talk with gentlemen like yourselves, where you're so creative in finding ways to, to, to pay people or come up with means in which they can come on to your team. Yeah. So you brought up, so we've talked about a couple of things here. We've talked about people, we've talked about systems and processes, and we've talked about knowing your numbers and things like that. You brought up a point of like, I kind of, let's talk about this one last thing. And I think it's something that we've all had this transition of and just a new appreciation, appreciation for, and that's our time of how valuable our time actually is to be able to get stuff done, to be able to build our business, to be able to grow your business and things like that. And I think that's something that I feel like a lot of us would change the way we've done it over the last however many years, because now we look at our time so much more valuable. You just brought up that point of, you know, oh man, I can't pay somebody that's going to, that's going to eat into that. But really I look at that now, I was like, man, if I pay that person this amount, I get this much time left. I can grow, I can work on the business versus like Absolutely. working in the business and stuff. So I, I, I bet time is one of the first things if, you know, probably it might not have been on our list right away, but we're all thinking about like, oh yeah, this is something I would completely change. And I look at it completely different than I did when I first got started of how valuable your time is and looking into of like, how can I get more time to work on that business versus like, you know, on these little things that I'm doing each and every day of this admin stuff that I don't, I'm not good at anyway, and I don't want to be doing and that type of stuff. Well, no, I mean, I just, I, it's so funny. Like I, I, I piggyback it all the way back to what Dave was talking about in the sense of he scaled down his business and he made 30% more revenue. Uh, it's very similar in my business. I look at uh, when I was at a hundred doors, I was more profitable than when I was at 300 doors and I was less busy. So my time, if you 
look at per capita, I'm more than a favorite restaurant every day, and I work from there, had friends, and I was having a great time. Oh, my internet's so stable. Well, one of the things um, you did, so, did you wrap up? Are you done? I'm sorry, Sterling. Go ahead. No, no. I was just, so for me, when you start looking at time, I just hired my assistant uh, a week ago and I'm like sitting there like, well, what, what else do I do with my time? Like, cause she's taking all this off my plate and I realized, wait, Sterling, you haven't been doing this actually. You haven't been doing this. Well, just because you were just doing these things, there was stuff that you was dropping. So now you can focus on your the the wider picture and growth and vision. So, um, yeah. yeah. And, so and asking think, asking your team those questions of like, hey, what do what do I need to be working on too? I think is is very valuable. Or even your contractors or whoever you know things like, hey, what do I need to be doing to help you guys out? Or you know, what go what can I be doing? What am I missing? Those types of things are important mm-hmm. questions to be asking your team as well. Well, one of the things, and and I can we can I know we have to start to wrap up here, yeah. but. One of the things in relationship to time, and I can put it in perspective for all you guys. In in my teaching, one of the best analogies that I use is that we all have 80 years. And, you know, we might get to go in overtime a little longer than that, but we all have 80 years. So I'm 71. So in that 80 years, if it's a football game, I've got nine minutes left. Each quarter's worth 20 years. I got nine minutes left. Well, as the announcer would say in a football game, that's an eternity. You know, two minutes left in an NFL game is an eternity. So it's it's nothing that I feel bad about. But you guys are in quarter number two of your life. And so the, the, the more you take control of your time today will free you up when you're in the third and fourth quarter of your lives to be doing exactly the same things that you want to do based on your choices and not your need. So, you know, my time, my nine minutes is so much more valuable or so much more important than yours. But as soon as you guys and other young entrepreneurs make those times important, they, they will excel beyond their reasonable, you know, beyond, on anybody's reasonable expectations. So if you guys pay attention to that and your time today, then you won't get late in the fourth quarter worrying about, you know, worrying about different stuff. And I, I want all you guys to do that. I will say one of the, one of the coolest things of just having this conversation and talking about that and Gray, that was, or Dave, that was a great way to put that. I, I really appreciate it. Now that I'm at like at the halfway point, I'm going to think it a little differently about that too. But, <laughs> um, and thinking about that and we're all a testament to this, no matter what quarter you're in or no matter how many minutes you have left, if you want to look at it that way in that analogy, but it's all fixable. Dave just said, he, Dave just said he's, he's 71, but he just started changing his numbers and really digging into his numbers in the last 18 months. And it's, it's fixable now. So no matter what you're doing in your business, no matter if it's a people person or a, a people problem, um, a process problem, a numbers problem, a time problem, all that stuff is fixable and can all be changed, you know, today or within the next quarter or whatever it may be to make your business what you need it to be to be successful. So just keep that in mind. Um, if you need help from any of us at all, we'd be more than happy to reach out to any of us. Um, Gentlemen, do me a favor. Let's go ahead and go around the horn and just give out our contact information. People do want to reach out to us um, and just, you know, dig into kind of some of our experiences going through any of this stuff, I think would be good. Um, So Sterling, let's start with you, man. Yeah. Sterling Davis will be Fosti Property Management. Thanks so much uh, for just having it. I mean, honestly, this is good. I learned a lot. Um, even just listening to both of you. Uh, I mean, it's just always good to be able to do these. Um, you can reach me at Sterling. Uh, you can reach me at S Davis at ethosity management.com. That's S Davis at E T H O S I T Y management spelled all the way up.com. Uh, are on Facebook Sterling M Davis senior. Um, I seem like I get a lot of uh, Facebook messages right now. <laughs> People jump in my DMs. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Dave, how about you? Uh, it's Dave Short. It's D Short at C21 Sheets, S C H E E T Z dot com. So you can uh, easily get a hold of. I'm pretty responsive and get back to people. 
Awesome. Awesome. And you can reach out to me at Brian at simple wholesaling.com. Um, or like Sterling said, find me on Facebook, um, and, and things like that. So we're all over the place on social media. Um, as you know, all of us are and things. So feel free to reach out to us. Like I said, we do this, um, to help educate, help investors, just help in any way that we can. Um, hopefully we brought you some value today. And with that, we will see you next time on the Indie Investor Pod. Take care.